Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Fieldstone for you. We are happy to see all of you on this hot, hot, hot August day where some of us are still inside, some are working from home. Um, we are excited that we get to record these, so make sure you go to our YouTube channel, just search for Fieldstone Leadership Network Orange County, and you can see um, all of our videos. And so we will record this so that you can access it later and share it with your colleagues. Um, a couple of housekeeping, just make sure you mute your screen so that it doesn't interfere when Ron is talking. And um, if you wouldn't mind just putting questions in through the chat, although there's just a few of us, so I'm sure put it in the chat and then that way Ron can see the questions and we can answer them as we go along. Um, I want to thank Janet Buck and Marn McGill over at First Republic. They are our corporate sponsor of these wonderful Zoom webinars, so we're grateful to them for their support. Um, Ron is a good friend to Fieldstone now, whether he wanted to be or not, he now is our best friend. But it's awesome because I just recently sent out a survey to everybody asking what they wanted and what have been their kind of favorite things so far. And over and over again, it's, we love hearing from the employment attorney. So um, I just wanna thank you, Ron, for continuing to say yes when I reach out to you and say, okay, it's been a month, it's time. Because things are very different today than they were a month ago, and certainly they're very different than they were back in March. So um, I had one um, question sent to me earlier that I sent to Ron, so Ron can address that. But, you know, we have 45 minutes. That's the latest research is they said if you can get it down to 45 minutes, that's best. An hour seems to be a little too long. But certainly it's a small group, and if you have questions, feel free to um, ask away. But I'm just going to let Ron um, again introduce. Let me have everybody introduce themselves first so that Ron knows who's in the room, and then we'll go back. Ron will introduce himself, and then um, I'll let you go and tell us what's new and what's, what's going on out there. So, Allison, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Allison. Stanley. I'm the Human Resources Manager at Project Access. Um, we have about 100 employees that work in 13 states. Most of them are in California, though. You're on mute. <laughs> okay, Lauren. Uh, can you, Ron, mute your computer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to turn down my volume. It's not muted. Okay, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Brand, and I'm the Director of Operations for uh, Mind OC for Be Well OC. Sharon? Oh, hi. I'm Sharon Ella, CEO of Habitat Orange County. Hi, Ron. Hi, Laura. Hello. Hi. Sally, nice to see you. Oh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Um, when am I? I'm on the board of <laughs> the Association of Fundraising Professionals and recently uh, the Media Pass Director of Development for the Boy Scouts of Orange County. Nadia, we can't see you, but I, we can hear you. She's muted. She might be muted. We've got two on, so. All right. We'll go ahead. All right, Ron, it's all you. Tell us who you are. For, I don't know how many. There are a couple here that don't know you, but it's all yours. A couple know me. I think Lauren knows me a little bit. Uh, Sharon knows <laughs> me. <laughs> so my name is Ron Brand. I'm a partner at Kahana and Feld. Uh, I practice labor and employment defense. I've been doing it for about 20 years. Uh, and so this is my third or fourth time, I think, doing this Fieldstone uh, seminar. So. Uh, I'm here to basically ask any questions you have regarding COVID-19 and how it relates to labor and employment issues. Uh, I guess as any other employment issues you may, you may have as well, but primarily relating to COVID-19. Um, th there, there were a couple of things I wanted to talk about, but before I get to those, I do want to address the email that Robin sent to me. And I'm not sure who sent it. I need a little bit more information. The email says, the further we continue with COVID, the closer we get to potential furlough, layoffs, and cuts. There's a lot of anxiety that goes with it making the nonprofit sector an even more challenging place to be employed. Anything with that would be helpful. So I need a little bit more information uh, about what specifically uh, that person is looking for. And it, 
Is the person who wrote this on? No. Okay. Well, I'm not 100% sure what he or she is referring to, so I'll put that to the side. But what I did want to address first before I take questions is that in, in giving advice to companies over the past several months, uh, I found that there are four common COVID-19 misunderstandings that I think could place companies at risk. Um, and, you know, over the past few months, the CDC, as well as other governmental agencies have issued changing guidance for employers uh, that many employers view as complex, confusing, and practical. I think it's hard for us to really understand what all these guidelines mean. And so I think there are four areas where uh, I think I can clarify some of the guidelines and that will hopefully create a little bit more protection to companies when they're dealing with uh, employees who uh, either get tested positive for COVID-19 um, or are exposed to people who have COVID-19. So the first misconception that I found is um, returning exposed employees to work too early after a negative test. So I've had clients call me, they said, okay, uh, our client, uh, an employee of ours, uh, was just tested negative, was exposed to somebody a few days ago, uh, today tested negative, and we want to bring that employee back. And there is conflicting guidance about that, but what I've determined is that even if you test an employee and the employee is negative, you still have to wait the 14 days since their last direct exposure because people can have COVID-19 and not exhibit any symptoms. And the incubation period is generally 14 days. So if you have an employee that comes to you and says, uh, I was exposed to someone who had COVID-19 yesterday, today I took a test, it came back negative, I wanna come back to work. I would counsel against that. You should quarantine that person at home for 14 days. And even the CDC has recognized that there's been a misunderstanding regarding this guideline. Um, and the CDC itself says uh, that the CDC recommends 14 days of quarantine after exposure based on the time it takes to develop illness if infected. Thus, it is, impossible that a, it is possible that a person known to be infected could leave isolation earlier than a person who is quarantined because of the possibility they are infected. So again, I would say even if an employee tests uh, negative for COVID-19, if that person is still within that 14 day incubation period from the time that they were exposed to the other person, I would still only have them come to work after 14 days, regardless of within that 14 day period, if uh, the person has tested negative. Okay, the other misconception that I uh, have uh, heard from clients is, uh, miscalculating the appropriate quarantine period for those exposed to an infected household member. So the key is that the 14 day quarantine period does not begin until the last day the employee was directly exposed. So you have to look at what was the last day and from that period you count the 14 days. And what does direct exposure mean? Now the CDC has come up with a definition of direct exposure. And that definition is being within six feet of the infected person for 15 or more minutes within the past 48 hours. Yeah. How, how accurate is that? I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> if, you know, if somebody's within, you know, five feet for 14 minutes for 47 hours, does that mean they are not direct exposure? Who knows? But this is just gives you a guideline um, of uh, what direct exposure means. But you know, I always tell clients that even if they don't fall within those guidelines, if you have somebody that was working fairly closely with somebody else, uh, you know, within you know several feet uh, for you know even five ten minutes, I would probably want to have that person be quarantined. It's better to be safe than sorry, in my view. Another misconception is, or an issue that some employers are confused about is not notifying employees of a confirmed COVID-19 case in your workplace. Now, a lot of my clients will say, okay, you know, 
this individual was in direct contact according to the CDC definition. And so we're gonna inform those employees that they may have been uh, exposed to COVID-19. But my recommendation is to notify basically any, you know, employee who is in any way, has any type of contact with the infected employee. So I would inform employees who worked near the infected employee, meaning if they were in the same hallway, area, corridor, even if they weren't directly exposed, I would still inform employees who work near the infected worker that they may have been exposed and that they should maybe seek, uh, you know, get a test or seek the advice of a healthcare, uh, you know, a doctor or, or other uh, healthcare authority. Um, but remember, it's very important that you do not identify the name of the individual that was exposed or that may, sorry, that may, that may have COVID-19, either was um, tested positive for, for COVID-19 or was near somebody who has COVID-19 and that employee also needs to be quarantined. So do not identify the name of the infected worker because that person has a right to privacy in his or her medical information. But you can definitely tell all the employees who worked near that employee that they have worked near an employee that employees infected, so they may have been exposed, and therefore they need to seek, um, you know, guidance from their doctor, and even possibly taking a uh, COVID nineteen test. I've also had some clients who who have said, well, even if you're, you know, within six feet of somebody for fifteen or more minutes, uh, and it was in the prior forty eight hours, we we were all wearing masks, so it doesn't matter, uh, you know we don't need to inform those employees of the infected worker because everybody was wearing a mask. And that is uh, an incorrect uh, belief. Even if all the employees in the office um, was wearing a mask, if there's an infected worker, you, you still have to tell all the employees who worked near that person that they may have been exposed to COVID-19. And even the CDC says, even CDC highlights that point. The CDC says that um, this is irrespective of whether the person with COVID-19 or the contact was wearing a mask or whether the contact, that means the person who may have been exposed, um, was wearing respiratory personal protective equipment. So to ensure the safety of your workers, remember to quarantine all employees who meet the six foot 1548 analysis, even if they were wearing a mask while exposed. And, you know, even though the CDC guidelines, they're not technically a law, they're not technically a regulation, those guidelines can be construed by OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and possibly the courts as the legal standard that defines what action a company should take to protect its workers. Um, and in fact, the Assistant Secretary for the US Department of Labor has already indicated that OSHA could rely upon what's called the general duty clause to enforce CDC guidelines uh, for employers regarding COVID-19 issues. And the general duty clause is basically the clause that states that, um, work, that companies have to furnish to their employees a place of employment that is free from recognized hazards and uh, free from uh, other from hazards that are likely to, I don't remember exactly the wording, but basically hazards that could either cause injury or death. So the company has to take measures to make sure that those hazards are not there. And that's why I tell my clients, you should follow the CDC guidelines as well as any state, county, local guidelines to protect your employees. Because if a company fails to follow these guidelines, there is a potential that it could receive a citation from OSHA and as well as from Cal OSHA saying that they were willful, right? Because they were recklessly disregard for employee safety because they didn't follow CDC guidelines. And the maximum penalty for a willful violation of the general duty clause is $134,937. <laughs> <laughs> Where did they come up with that number? I have no idea. Uh, and this is separate apart from uh, 
lawsuits. I mean, there are lawsuits in, in, in the US now where employees have sued companies in court saying that they were either negligent or reckless in not following CDC guidelines and employees became infected. So those were kind of the four main misunderstandings that I wanted to go over quickly with you because I've been getting a lot of questions about that and I see there are some questions here. Okay, from Sharon, do they need to be tested again after the 14 days before returning to work? I think it's, yeah, I think it's a good idea. So if somebody, so if an employee comes to you and says, um, my mother uh, is infected with COVID-19, I got tested today, you know, I was with her yesterday, I got tested today, the test is negative, we'll have that person wait the 14 days, then at the 14 days, yeah, I would probably have the employee get tested again. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is the employee, or does the employee need to show documentation upon returning to work? You can require it, yes. You can require that the employee provide a doctor's note or even the, the results of the test itself saying that uh, they are not infected with COVID-19. Absolutely. Um, so Ron, I'm curious about the furlough, if you can, again, kind of define it, what furlough looks like today and what, um, is the employee protected under furlough? I mean, can they get furloughed on a Monday and get terminated on a Tuesday? Like what happens with their benefits? How does that work? Right, so a, a furlough is essentially a leave of absence where the person is still employed by the company, but the person is on a leave of absence. And usually it's unpaid. And in California and in most states now because of COVID-19, furloughed employees can get unemployment insurance. It used to be that, that that's not the case, right? If you were furloughed, you were still employed, you couldn't get unemployment insurance. But because of uh, the nature and extent of, of the pandemic, they now, the, the California Employment Development Department, I said, if, if you're furloughed, you can get unemployment insurance. So basically it's a leave of absence uh, that's unpaid. Some companies can choose to pay them if they want. Uh, in terms of benefits, you have to take a look at the applicable insurance policies to see if a person has to work a certain number of hours of a week in order to get, uh, let's say, healthcare benefits. So maybe for some furloughed employees, we get COBRA notices because even though they're employed, they're still not working the requisite number of hours to be covered by the health insurance plan. And so a furlough, again, is just a leave of absence. And some companies put people on furlough for a, a few weeks, a few months, and then call them back to work. Other companies say, you've been on furlough for a month, we simply don't have the work for you because of COVID-19, and now we're formally going to lay you off. A layoff is a type of termination. Um, and what else about it can I say? Um, you know, you can terminate, there, there, there's no specific time frame requirement of when you can or cannot ter some, terminate somebody on furlough. It's really up to the employer to decide. Um, th there are a couple other things to consider when furloughing people. For a non-exempt employee, meaning an employee that gets paid by the hour and you have to follow all the wage and hour rules about timekeeping and meal breaks and rest breaks, if you furlough that person, since you pay that person by the hour and that person is not working at all, you're not going to owe that employee any money. But for exempt employees who are paid on a salary, Remember the rule that if a, if a salaried exempt employee works any portion of a week, they generally have to get paid for that week, okay? And so if you furlough somebody, but then somebody works one day for like five hours, you technically have to pay that person that whole week of salary. So it's key that if you're going to furlough salaried exempt employees, that you do, do so on a week by week basis. So that, and make it clear that they cannot work during that week. Whereas with a, uh, you know, a, a non-exempt non employee, if a non-exempt employee happens to work one hour during a week that the person is furloughed, you only owe that person one hour of pay. Okay, so that's, so it's just important that for non, for exempt salaried employees, if you're gonna furlough them, um, make sure it's done on a week by week basis and make it clear to them that they cannot work at all during that week. 
Um, there's another issue about whether when, if you furlough somebody, you have to pay them any wages that they're due and owing at that time, as opposed to the next payroll period. So for, so for example, if you terminate some, if you put somebody on furlough, you know, on the 10th and their next paycheck is the 15th, and I'm talking about uh, non-exempt employees, there's an unresolved issue of whether or not once you furlough that person, you have to pay them those wages on the 10th, or if you could pay them on the 15th according to the normal payroll cycle. The California Labor Commissioner has said that if the furlough is going to be longer than two weeks, that they think you should pay them immediately upon the furlough and not within several days. And why is that significant? Because there could be what's called waiting time penalties. I don't know if you've all heard of waiting time penalties. It's the basic California law that says that if you terminate somebody, you have to immediately pay them all wages due and owing at the time of termination. Mm -hmm. If somebody voluntarily resigns, you have 72 hours to pay those wages. And so if you don't pay wages immediately upon terminating somebody, the employee is entitled to one day of pay up to a maximum of 30 days for what they call waiting time penalties. And what the labor commissioner has said is, if a furlough is longer than two weeks, it's essentially akin to a termination for purposes of waiting time penalties, even though the person is not being terminated. It's just a labor commissioner opinion. It's not technically the law. Um, you know, I tell clients, the chance of it being an issue is so slim that, you know, if you're only talking a few days between when you furlough somebody and when that person is supposed to get, you know, paid according to the normal payroll schedule, just paid according to the normal payroll schedule. Because essentially that individual would have to file a claim with the labor commissioner, know that there is this obscure rule out there, you know, regarding furloughs and waiting time penalties. You know, it's typically, I mean, in the several months I've been doing this, I have not had a client come to me and say, we furloughed these employees on the 10th. We didn't pay them their wages immediately. We waited until the next payroll period and the furlough was a month. And then these employees filed a claim with the labor commissioner. You know, but if you want to be super conservative and cautious, if you're going to furlough somebody and you know that it's going to be longer than a couple of weeks, pay them their wages at the time of the furlough. Hmm. Yeah. I know it's kind of crazy. It's California, you know, California crazy rules. Yeah. So Ron, what are you seeing out there? What are the trends? What are the issues? Well, a lot of the issues are uh, maintaining a safe workplace about when people um, either are exposed to COVID-19 or test positive for COVID-19, how you deal with those issues. And we went over some of those things you know, earlier today. Um, what steps employers can take to maintain a safe work environment following all the CDC guidelines. Um, there are wage and hour issues regarding people working from home. So under California law, employers are required to indemnify their employees for any expenses they incur in the course and scope of their employment. And so when people are working from home, um, they have to use a computer, they have to use internet, uh, they have to use other equipment. And so employers are required to provide them with the equipment that they need to perform their job or reimburse them for uh, equipment they need to perform the job. Uh, and for example, like internet connection, okay? Technically employers need to reimburse employees a certain amount uh, of the monthly internet bill because even though, even though they are paying that same amount, let's say 50 bucks a month before COVID-19, now that they're working from home and they need to use the internet for work, um, courts would probably say that employers have to reimburse them a, a reasonable amount for the internet service. The same logic goes for cell phone usage. There have been cases about cell phones where employees have personal cell phones and they've always been paying $100 a month. They got a job, the employer says, you know, you can use your own cell phone, and but you need to be available by cell phone, and you should you need to use your cell phone for work purposes. And the and courts have said that you have to reimburse the employee a certain percentage of the cell phone usage. I typically say reimburse them one third, right? It, assuming someone works eight hours a day on average, 
you know, reimburse them a third of the cell phone usage, reimburse them a third of the internet usage, and make sure that if employees uh, purchase supplies and equipment to perform their job at home, that you reimburse them. And you have to make it clear to them that they need to submit receipts and you should have a reimbursement policy in place that discusses how you reimburse employees. Um, but that's one area that I've seen. Uh, another area is where people have to wait in line, uh, waiting to get tested before they go into work. A lot of companies will uh, take the temperature of employees before they come into the office. And so sometimes a line backs up and if the people, if those employees wait in line, technically you have to pay them for that time that they wait, even as, even those before they actually clock in. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of, there are a lot of lawsuits out there. There's a, a law firm that I used to work at called Fisher and Phillips, where they have this litigation tracker, COVID-19 litigation tracker, and all over the country. And if you look in California, I'm just looking at it now, there are, um, let me see here, in California, 95 complaints in California that have been filed, ranging anywhere from uh, like employment discrimination regarding people, you know, COVID-19 issues to remote, remote work, leave issues. Um, there are 516 complaints around the country dealing with employment related COVID-19 issues. This is a gold mine for plaintiff's lawyers. <laughs> Just because this is brand new to us, courts haven't interpreted the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, we've never dealt with, with these safety health issues. And so this is, like I said, a gold mine for plaintiff's attorneys. That's why it's so important that employers comply with the laws as much as they can and follow federal, local, state, county safety and health guidelines as much as possible. Let's see, there's a question from Sharon. Now the kids are back in school. Many employees are challenged to do their work and supervise their young children. Is there a guidance for what an employer needs to do to meet this new challenge? Yeah, this is, this is very difficult. Um, a lot of people are working from home and having to take care of their young children. My advice to clients is be flexible, you know, work with your employees to the extent you can to be understanding. I mean, there could be some situations where an employee cannot do any work because he or she has to supervise children. And in that situation, you know, they would be entitled to this, um, you know, emergency paid family leave for a couple of weeks. But then what happens after that? Uh, exactly. you know, for companies with um, fewer than 25 employees, they don't have to take that person back to work. A company with more than 25 employees may have to take that person back to work. So I just tell clients, just be flexible, try to work with the employee as much as you can. But ultimately, if the employee cannot perform the job at all, uh, you know, there may come a time where the employee has to be terminated. And we'll see what, what cases, what courts, uh, how they interpret this Family First Coronavirus Response Act. That's the statute that provides emergency paid sick leave and emergency paid family leave. Lawsuits have been filed about that and we'll see how courts interpret that. And there are Department of Labor guidelines. If you uh, Google Department of Labor FAQ for Families First Coronavirus Response Act, you'll pull up their uh, FAQs and they go through a lot of these um, questions and answers. And I think they, they even advise, the Department of Labor even advises, just try to be as flexible as you can you know, with employees. If this is an unprecedented time and it's all new to everybody. Um, let's see, Kevin Hamilton, I don't know, I see here. Oh, you don't want us to think there was an intruder, got it. I thought, I thought that, she said there was an intruder. <laughs> as soon as I thought, who is Kevin? I was going to text Robin and say, who is this person? But right, right. I was ready to block you if I had to. Um, yeah, okay. I'm hearing that a lot, Ron, from um, our leaders that, you know, their staff, 
they, they get it that their staff has to be home to take care of kids, but they said, we've got a job to do. We've got an organization right. that needs to serve its clients and our people won't come back. And, you know, I don't have an answer for them. And I mean, being flexible is a, it's a great suggestion, but I know for how long and we don't know how long. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to tell. I mean, I, I mean, certainly for the two weeks that they're, that they're getting this emergency paid, well, there's emergency paid sick leave, but there's this emergency paid, you know, family leave where you pay two thirds of, you know, their um, uh, rate of pay. Um, so, yeah, it's tough. I mean, certainly while they're on emergency paid family leave, don't terminate them, you know, but after emergency paid family leave, if the person cannot do the job at all and there's no way to try to fit this square peg into a round hole, then you may have no choice but to terminate. Yeah. I mean, the, the person, the person has to be able to ultimately do the job. Right. But if you terminate them during COVID, chances are they're going to sue you and will they probably win? Well, again, it depends. I mean, if the person was unable to, to, to do the job at all, uh, and I mean, a person has to be able to do the job at some point. And so, you know, after emergency paid family leave expires, if, um, you know, the person still needs to take time off to care for children, you know, you may need to accommodate a little bit more you need to be reasonable, but there's going to become a point where if it becomes just an undue burden on the company, the company may have no choice to terminate the person and the defense this is an undue burden. You know, it, it's really a fact intensive inquiry. You know, if you can find a temp to do the job for a few weeks and the employee says, look, I'll have, I'll have daycare in a month of work and you can get a temp to do the job pretty easily, I would say accommodate that person. Go for it. Okay. But if the person says, look, I won't be able to get uh, daycare for six months and this person is the CFO and is critical to the operation of the business, then I would say you have a good argument that you can't keep that job open for that person. So really a, a, on a fact by, fa by fact basis, a case by case basis. That's a great suggestion to get a temp worker in in that duration. That's a great suggestion if you have a resource. Right, and, and I would also recommend that if the situation comes up that uh, either the HR person at the company is involved in it. And if the HR person feels like they need more help, they call you know, somebody like me, a labor and employment attorney, who can walk through everything and give an analysis and you know, give some recommendations on what to do. Seems so crazy. Do we have 4.37, do we have other questions, comments? I, I just had a, a question. You may have addressed this at another um, webinar, but when they're forced to take the 14 day quarantine period, are they paid? Do they take sick leave? What happens to them? Right. So you have, you have this emergency paid sick leave, okay. right? And the, um, the three reasons why um, somebody can get this emergency paid sick leave, you know, for two weeks, the 80 hours, you know, if the employee is subject to some type of quarantine or isolation order and, and more, and the Department of Labor has said that this order could be the state of California order saying, you know, stay at home, don't go to work. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons why somebody can get paid emergency paid sick leave. Or if the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self quarantine because of concerns related to COVID-19, or if the person is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and is seeking a medical uh, advice about it, or if the employee is experiencing any other, what do they call it, like substantially similar condition as determined by some federal agency, what does that mean? I have no idea. So my advice is if you're going to tell somebody to stay at home and be quarantined for 14 days, I'd probably pay them. I mean, number one, um, you're probably required to, although it's not entirely clear, because if you tell somebody to stay home, it doesn't technically fall under one of those three reasons. It could fall under this substantially similar condition reason. Um, but I would say to be cautious, 
assume that it, it probably, you probably are required to do so. And second, I think it increases employee morale. You know, that, that, that this employee knows that you care about him or her, that you're not just sending him or her home without any money. Um, and so I think for those two reasons, if you have the money, pay it. Of course, if you don't have the money, you know, and you don't want to set a precedent, then don't do it. But if, you know, for two weeks, somebody who's a paid hourly employee, I don't think you're talking about a tremendous amount of money, but I also know that you're nonprofits and you don't have a lot of money either. Uh, but I would certainly take that into account. If you're going to tell somebody you were exposed to, uh, you know, COVID-19, we want you to stay home for 14 days. If you can, I pay them. I thought, I thought that there was a government program that would pay for that, that employee, no? Yeah, so there would be unemployment. So yeah, they, they could apply for unemployment insurance. Oh. But, but yes, they could apply for unemployment insurance because they are prevented from doing their job. But here's the, here's the reality of the situation. By the time they apply for unemployment insurance, there are hundreds <laughs> of thousands of cases backlogged. They may not get this money for another three months. <laughs> you know? So they need the money now to live more than likely. So if you are financially able to pay them and recognizing that maybe it'll set a precedent, but also recognizing what are the chances that you're going to have dozens of employees, you know, have COVID-19 or be exposed to it, I, I would probably pay them. Do, um, can you expect them to work from home if they're being quarantined? Yeah, so that's so right. So good question. So if you're sending them home and they can work from home, then they should. Yes. So yeah, I, I'm glad you raised that because Sally, the question you were asking, uh -huh. I thought the assumption was that they weren't able to work. Yeah, that was the assumption. Okay, and if they're not able yeah, to work. Yeah, yeah, but if they it, can work from home, then it Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, the emergency paid sick leave law specifically states if they are unable to work or telework, okay, then they would be entitled to this emergency paid sick leave. But certainly, if the person can work from home, then yeah, I mean, the person can't say, oh, you know, I don't want to work from home, even though I can. I want you to pay me 80 hours without yeah. working. Sorry, yeah. it, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think most employees, um, if they can work from home, they would. Mm -hmm. Even if you tell them, please quarantine. I've had numerous clients call me with this specific scenario. And I haven't heard from them that an employee has balked or you know, has said, no, I'm not going to work from home. I think most employees are probably responsible enough. They recognize that if they've been exposed to COVID-19, they should stay at home. And if they can work from home, they should. I'm happy to stay you know, until five o'clock or longer if you want, if, if there are any other questions. Oh, I think you're good. Other questions while we have Ron? We're so lucky that you do this for us, Ron. It's so incredibly helpful. That was my pleasure. My way of giving back. <laughs> I love it. Any other questions Anything before else? we let him go? We're going to record this and then Ron, you know, I'll reach out to you probably in a month and set up another one. And sure. maybe by then we'll have a vaccine and maybe Hopefully. people will be back at work and uh, we can only hope. Yeah, realistically, I think we're looking at probably early next year, mm -hmm. early to mid next year, just from what I've read. But, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, so... I don't know, but just from what I've read, I think realistically we're looking at next year. So can I can I ask your professional legal opinion on what sure. you think about kids going back to school in person? That's, I, I think if the school takes proper steps to maintain the health and safety of the children, then it's, I, I would probably risk it with my kids if they're social distancing, if they wear masks, you know, if they clean everything, if they stagger the classes, right? Certain kids go to school on this day, certain kids go on, up on that day. I probably would allow my kids to, to do that. But if they're not going to have masks, they're not going to socially distance, I don't know. I probably wouldn't send my kids to school. I have a 16 and a half year old and he goes to Corona Del Mar High School. And so they're starting off the school year with all online. And then they're going to slowly... Uh, bring kids back to school, staggering with masks. And so I, I feel comfortable with that. Yeah. What about you guys? Well, I, have a, I have a fun fact to share. 
Sharon Ellis was the principal at Corona Del Mar High School for many years. Mm. <laughs> oh, really? Funny. Okay, great. I'm really happy I'm, I'm not in education right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gosh. Yeah, I, I can tell you, um, my daughter is a teacher in the state of Nevada. And, at Never Christ, been and she's a kindergarten teacher, and they reduced her class size to 12 students, and they're all socially distanced. Mm -hmm. They do come in, and the teachers have to wear masks, yeah. and they they're very regimented about when the teachers can come, when the students can come, and they stay together. You know, the children don't intermingle with other children. So it's, it's seemed to have worked. They just started Monday, so it, it <laughs> seems to be working, but it's only been a week, so I don't know. Uh, I, I've seen, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, Allison, what's Brian's, is he just, um, he's a high school uh, teacher. Yeah, he's a high school teacher at Garden Grove Unified. They're all remote, I mean virtual, mm -hmm. I should say. But the teachers can go on campus, but the kids can't right now. Does he have any idea when they're allowed? Will they be allowed? None. Even if no we fall, because like we fought, fought, fell off the watch list. Yeah. Have to get off the watch list first. But I, what yeah. I heard is that they, you, even if you're off the watch list, it'll take them a minimum of two to three weeks to turn it around so kids actually can come back. It, it right. isn't just immediate. Well, mm -hmm. it's if you're off the watch list. What's that, Allison? Even if they're allowed, it's still up to the school district. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was just curious to know what you thought. Thank you for <laughs> shedding light on that. Yeah. That it's scary, scary. It is scary. Yeah. yeah. And well, thank you. Thank you again, everybody. <laughs> be well, be yeah. safe, stay healthy, and um, watch for further Fieldstone for use from Robin. And um, have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ron.